Welcome to uh, lecture two, or uh, lectures part two for module one. In this series of lectures, I'm going to kind of hit the high points of the reading and give you a little bit of an insight in terms of the major themes. Uh, these lectures are not designed to replace the textbook. You will have to read through the textbook and hit the key points in order to successfully complete the quizzes. So let's begin. The, um, the main ideas today that we'll be seeing are, again, the geographer's perspective, and then we'll talk a little bit about globalization. And, when I, and the reason I say globalization and is that right now there are many different themes that are counter to globalization. We can sometimes talk about national identity. Uh, in the United States, we talk about this kind of concept of America first. Uh, we often will sometimes see uh, scholars talk about diversity as the and or the opposition of it. So I, I put that forward as kind of an and and the, the terms that are out there today. Uh, in addition, we have geography. We're going to talk about it and its main themes. And of course, the tools of the geographer. Okay. I want to look at Earth, first of all, without regions, without borders. So what we're seeing here uh, is composite imagery that is looking down at Earth uh, in North America. And if you look carefully, you can see Florida, Cuba, um, and the North American continent as the isthmus moves towards South America. But in this view, what we see is Earth as a totality. We see water vapor in the atmosphere. We see ice uh, in the northern uh, Arctic Ocean. But we don't see what we often conceive of as regions. In the same way, we can look at the other hemisphere here. And now we're centered on the Indian subcontinent. You can see the Arabian Peninsula, uh, northern Africa. So all these concepts in our head that are, in fact, regions. But again, we don't see at this scale, really all we see are boundaries and transitions that are natural in their origin. Now we have a little bit different view. This is what we call uh, the night sky or Earth at night. And what we see here is a, uh, a modeling of light that is uh, emitted light from human settlements across the globe. And in this case, now we see the world in a very different view. Here, what we see is a concentration. I'm going to move my mouse around a bit here. And you'll notice, for example, we can clearly see the United States. And in fact, it's quite easy to see how the shape of human occupancy extends into Canada and the prairie provinces, and then along the coastal regions into the isthmus. And when we look into South America, a very different concentration of lights and human beings. Likewise, when we look at the African continent, we can see the West Coastal concentrations, the South African concentrations, and here, quite amazingly, the Nile Delta and the Egyptian concentrations. And then this high amount of light again in Europe, fading out towards the center of the Eurasian landmass, the concentrations here along the Ganges Plain, and then again into Eastern China. So again, different way of looking at boundaries and regions. Again, this beautiful classic image that we see the, uh, the Nile Delta and, in fact, the area of Israel uh, moving into Jordan. And, of course, the very important uh, processes of water and the concentration of human occupancy. The United States, what I find so fascinating about this portion of it is if we look to the west. Now, I grew up here in uh, the Chicago and in the suburbs. And if you look out here, here we are, and we move towards Pennsylvania, that you'll notice that it looks real spotty, but it's fairly irregular. As you move out to the west, look how regular these the spacing is. And that's something that we'll talk about a little bit in terms of North American settlement patterns. But again, patterns on the landscape. Now, this is a very, very different uh, view of world and regions. What you see here is internet connectivity and the movement of data between internet hubs. And what is fascinating here, again, is the, the amount of data flowing from North America, particularly the eastern part of the United States, into Western Europe. And then again, this kind of localized flow, high concentration flow within China. Also, we can see the, the formation of the Indian subcontinent and the dearth of data flow within much of 
Sub-Saharan Africa and within much of South America. Again, a similar view with a higher functionality again just across. And again, these are two ways of looking at data flow internal and connectivity. Now, another way of kind of conceiving of this is tweeting. And it might be, if you want to give a, a, a kind of interesting little look, uh, tweetping.net records tweet uh, behaviors through time. And what you'll notice is that, again, connectivity, the internet, uh, social media are all recreating what we understand to be regions and connectivity. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in terms of globalization. Uh, another way of looking, again, one million tweet map, you'll watch tweets actually form. And again, this is simply a way of understanding new landscapes. And we're going to look at the question of what do we mean now about globalization and connectivity? So what is this term globalization that's going to come up again and again throughout this, uh, this course? And one way of understanding it is the increasing connectedness of people and places through economic, political, and cultural activities. Well, we just looked at a couple of those that actually fall into both or all, really all three of these categories. If we think about it, economic activity now is so often done through the internet. The power of political discourse and the ability or inability to control uh, social media and media outlets falls into the political realm and of course then cultural activities and the exchange of cultural ideas all are beginning to be part of this this web worldwide web and the web presence social media and the reconstruction of what we understand to be culture so that's globalization now we can also see this manifest in terms of simply what we see on the landscape now this is a series uh, this picture here are students that I took to China several years ago and what I want you to notice here is this is actually in a restaurant in China where they sell something called California Beef Noodle. And in fact, this is a restaurant chain called California Beef Noodle Kitchen. Now, in California, I've never had California Beef Noodles. In fact, I've never had them in the United States. You'll notice that the chairs are covered with Coca-Cola covers. So it's an American term for a noodle dish that's Chinese actually in its origin, and they're selling Coca-Cola. All of these suggest kind of the, the nature of cultural factors that result from globalization. So what I want you to think about then is globalization is about interregional linkages. That is the connections that begin to form between regions and those regions may be very close, Mexico and the United States, or really quite far apart, the United States and China. The growth of those linkages is, in fact, what we refer to then as, as globalization. And as we move through the semester, please begin to think about the question of the values, the cultural impacts, and the impacts on ethnicity that come from globalization. Now, globalization isn't new. If you look at this map, we can see, in fact, this is a, a historical uh, landscape, and this is the Silk Road. And what you'll notice is that, again, starting just after uh, the Roman Empire developed, we saw an, a, a rather dramatic uh, increase in the exchange between Europe and South Asia and into East Asia. And so these exchanges back and forth from uh, Imperial China through the, Im the Indian principalities into Persia and into Europe, in fact, were a form of globalization and quite effective. We also see it in terms of the triangular trade between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. This is a picture of um, plantation life in the West Indies. And you'll notice that you see an amalgam of uh, Afro-Caribbean culture, Dutch culture, and in fact, to some degree, even the indigenous cultures of the region. Today, globalization continues uh, in terms of Chinese investment, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, China has, has taken the lead in terms of investment, internal or international direct investment in infrastructure development in Africa. And when we get to the African section and into the Asian section, we're going to see the importance of these connections. Now again, 
what I want you to understand is that sometimes, and this, this is some of my students again in, in China, eating something called a stinky tofu. You'll notice them holding their noses. Sometimes there are aspects of culture that simply don't translate. And as we move through the semester, you're going to see those as well. So what are the pros of globalization? Well, first and foremost, it does increase economic efficiency, at least at a global scale. It can, and often does, increase competition and access to goods. It certainly increases specialization based on differences in labor costs, material costs, and transportation costs. And it can, argue, it has been argued, develop free market economies. Now, the flip side is also true. The wealth that is generated through globalization tends to concentrate in the countries that start out wealthy. It does benefit the rich and in many cases actually hurts the poor. In fact, again, increased competition in some cases reduces labor uh, value. It does develop, especially in, in some of the least developed countries, export-oriented economies. And in fact, often they are resource and energy intensive. That is, in a sense, the most wealthy countries are actually mining the least developed countries. It often uh, puts unfair expectations on developing countries. In other words, we, we expect more from them at more rapid rate than has been experienced by the more developed countries. Okay, that's the end of our first lecture. We will pick this up again on lecture two.